Today, we're going to talk a little bit about emotional eating. And I think this is a buzz term that we hear quite a bit among medical professionals as well as mental health professionals um, and just kind of in our world. I'm going to really break down what it means to have emotional eating habits as well as how to break the cycle of having them. One of the reasons we decided to do this presentation um, is A, again, I think it's a really big thing in our world, but actually a statistic that came out during the pandemic that we've had over the last year and a half or so is that uh, on average, people have gained about 20 to 25 pounds, which is a pretty significant amount. Um, and if we think about how our life has changed over the last year and a half, eating has also shifted quite a bit. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. So we really wanted to break it down and help everybody understand um, why we might be going to the refrigerator a little bit more and snacking more, um, but also how do, we, how do we break that cycle and have some more healthy habits as well. So what is emotional eating? Emotional eating is basically when we turn to food, when we are experiencing a major life event or a major stressor. Um, a lot of times emotional eating is uh, joint with a negative, quote unquote, negative emotion, meaning sadness, um, frustration, anger, hurt, those kind of emotions are often the ones that show up when we think about um, emotional eating. However, I also want to say on the flip side, if we are having um, really exciting or joyful moments or connecting with other people, a lot of time that centers around food as well. So food can be a really big piece um, of comfort, can also be a really big piece of connection for us too. We're going to focus a lot more on the stress and anger, um, boredom or loneliness as those emotions for the emotional eating for this presentation, but I wanted to make sure everybody understood there's definitely two different, two different ways of doing that. So here is what an emotional eating cycle looks like. So we feel anxious about something. So we're gonna take the pandemic since that is uh, kind of in our face right now and what we're, we're seeing um, mostly. So we're having some anxiety or some worries about the pandemic. Maybe it's, when is this going to end? Um, a vaccine anxiety is a really big thing right now, going back to work, things like that. So we're starting to get these really big feelings and we're not quite sure what to do with them. So what do we do? We either go to the refrigerator to look for something, we go to our cupboards, we open a bag of chocolate chip cookies and we say, hey, I'm only gonna eat one of them. Well, that doesn't really suffice for our brain. So instead of just eating one cookie, we eat 10 cookies. And then our brain gets this really big release of dopamine, which is the feel good chemical or the feel good um, hormone that enters our brain that says, wow, now I feel so much better. I feel, I feel great. I feel like I can go move on with my day. But then it goes from spiking and feeling really good to a lot of guilt. Um, some people feel shame or we feel that crash. So I think the other thing we hear from, from medical professionals a lot is when we do something like this, so we emotionally, we kind of have this sugar crash is usually what people describe it as meaning we might feel really good and really energetic for a minute, but then after that happens, it comes down very quickly and we kind of feel this lull. Um, we tend to feel heavier or depressed or um, still sad or, or the feelings of frustration and anger and stress come back to us as well. So what do we do? Well, we're still reaching the chemical imbalance thing, we're still reaching that feel good experience. And so we repeat this cycle. Um, so because we're, we had that crash, we're feeling those feelings. Well, we knew we felt better when we ate those chocolate chip cookies. So we're going to go back to those cookies. Um, emotional eating is very much like an addiction. And I'm not going to compare it to alcoholism or to um, being addicted to drugs, because it is different to a certain extent. However, the cycle is the same. We're never going to reach the same level of feel good with what we started with. So if we started with one cookie and we felt good, 
we have to eat two cookies to fill that same amount. And so those are the things that keep us kind of in that cycle and addicted to that eating piece as well. So how do we break this? Well, there's a few different ways. And the first way is we have to get really good about using our coping skills. Um, and we have to use our coping skills right after we're starting to have either feelings of stress or worry or bored. Boredom is a really big one. Um, I will say for those of you at home who have kids or teenagers, this has been a big one that I have seen as well. So any of those things, we start having these thoughts, we start having these feelings. Well, instead of going to the fridge or instead of going to our cupboard to get something to eat to relieve that, we can journal, we can go take a walk, we can call a friend, um, we can maybe do some creative outlet. I have people who will actually put a pause on their work for about five or 10 minutes and um, go draw or paint or color. Um, adult coloring books are a really big thing and they're, they're helpful. I mean, there's a reason that they exist in our world. And so doing something that's a little bit different from what our normal cycle is. Now, when we do those things, we actually still get the same release of dopamine, so our feel-good chemicals, and we start a different cycle. So instead of saying, okay, I'm going to take a walk, now I feel a little bit better, I'm feeling a little more energized, I'm feeling, I'm feeling good about stuff, my stress is gone. Um, it doesn't crash down to the immense guilt. And a lot of times that's because it's a natural way for us to increase our, our dopamine levels, our feel-good levels. And instead of having the spike, it's more of a hill. So it's it's not a mountain, it's a hill. Um, and that helps us because we don't actually go chasing that same quote unquote high, right? We don't go chasing those feel good chemicals and needing more and more and more of that in order for us to feel the same. All we have to do is go take a walk again. And it doesn't have to be an hour walk or a two hour walk. It can be a 15 minute walk or a 10 minute walk. Um, it could be calling a friend for a few minutes. It could be just writing a few sentences down in a journal. So it doesn't have to take a long amount of time. And it's actually a more natural way for us to get those feel good chemicals back into our body. Another big piece of this is how do we decipher um, physical hunger versus emotional hunger? And sometimes it's really hard for our brain to decide which is which. Um, they tend to, if we're not paying attention, which we'll kind of talk about mindfulness and, and around eating here in a little bit, but if we're not really paying attention, they feel the same. Our brain gets these signals that say, oh, I need to go to the fridge for something. I need to go eat something. And it's really hard if we're not in tune with ourselves where that is coming from. So here are some good ways to do it. So physical hunger comes on slowly. We typically don't feel it like a crash. Um, we feel it like, okay, I'm, I'm starting to get a little hungry. Maybe I'm starting to get a little tired. Um, I need something, something to eat to boost me up. So our stomach rumbling is a really big way to tell that, right? I think we all got told that when we were children. Um, if your stomach's rumbling, then you, you're probably hungry. But the low energy is also one. Um, and that can get a little tricky because if we are feeling sad or depressed, um, low energy can definitely be a part of that, but it's more of a gradual one. So I, so the example I like to give people is um, I'm feeling really great in the morning after breakfast and about 11 o'clock, I'm starting to kind of feel tired, like I'm slowing down, my brain's not working as well. I can go eat an apple and then I feel I feel like, oh, okay, I have a little bit more energy to get me through till lunch or, or whenever I have a break to eat. That's a little bit more of that physical hunger. Emotional hunger is associated with two different things. So one, it, come, it usually comes on pretty quickly. Um, and the second one is it's usually with a habit. So if you think about watching a movie, um, a lot of people eat popcorn when we watch movies or go to the movies. So if we sit down to say, okay, we're gonna watch a movie tonight. And your first thought is, oh, I need to get some popcorn in order for me to watch this movie. That's an emotional eating or a habit eating 
um, trigger. So we're not really doing it because we're hungry. Um, we may be doing it because we want to, but it's more just I, I feel the need that I have to do this, not necessarily my body needs this in order to survive. The other piece that I think is really big is um, figuring out physical hunger versus emotional hunger in a way that when you emotionally eat, you don't stop until you're uncomfortably full, meaning you eat so much that when you get up from the table, you actually feel miserable um, because you're overly full. When you're physically hungry, we usually have better triggers and better signals that go to our brain saying, oh, okay, I'm full now, I don't need to eat anymore. Um, meaning I don't need to get dessert or I don't need to have a second helping or any of that kind of stuff. Um, another piece that I really like to talk with people about is usually when we are physically hungry, we crave things that are nourishing for our body. So um, fruits, vegetables, protein, things like that, that are very, very much more nourishing and will hold our energy out a little bit longer. Emotional hunger really specifies around three different things, sweet, salty, and fatty foods. So we've heard of everybody who has had a um, maybe an emotional period and they want to go grab a pint of ice cream and eat the whole thing. Or I'm going to eat pizza and chocolate. Or I'm going to eat, um, you know, a whole pound of spaghetti. I mean, things like that tend to be more for that emotional hunger. I'm not saying it can't be for physical hunger. But if that's kind of your first thought to go to, um, it might be a trigger for us to say, oh, what am I really why am I really choosing this type of food right now? So one of my favorite things to talk about is, um, is how we fuel our, our body when we emotionally eat. So like I said, sweet, salty, and fatty foods are usually the first things that we go to when we emotionally eat. Um, and one of the stories I like to tell is uh, when my husband and I were trying to you know, get on a better eating diet. And we were in the middle of the pandemic, the fridge is always there. And so what we did is we went to the fridge all the time because it was, it was there, we were bored, um, we were lacking kind of our normal go out and do things. And so we would go to it all the time. Well, eventually we were going to it just because we were stressed or just because we were bored or we were, it, we were upset. And so we, we kind of figured this out and went, wow, like we're going to the fridge 10 times a day, which is not normal. We would never do that when we were at work. And so we put a sign up and said, um, on our fridge and said, what you're looking for isn't in here. And that's a, a really good thing. And I think that actually, it comes from, from Weight Watchers. Um, they use that a lot too with, with people, but it's a good thing to kind of make you stop and think about. Am I looking for something to satisfy an emotional need because I'm stressed and I don't know what to do with my stress and so I'm gonna eat something or am I coming in here because I need nourishment for my body? So it's really a change of mindset as we move forward. We'll, we'll talk a lot about that. How do we change our mindset? The other piece that, this was actually a story shared with me by someone as well. Um, so we see Starbucks, we drink Starbucks. And I think we all kind of could get into this cycle of, oh, we need a coffee on the way to work, right? We need a coffee on the way home from work. So here's the story. So pre-pandemic, a, a woman traveled frequently for work, and each time she saw a Starbucks sign, she stopped for a mocha frappuccino. So it usually was once a day. Now, when the pandemic hit, she didn't visit a Starbucks or really any food venue for several months because she couldn't. As time passed, she actually didn't start or she didn't need to stop anymore. She didn't have that urge to stop at the Starbucks sign anymore. Well, why is that? Well, because we created a new pathway in our brain saying, oh, I actually don't need that. It's not something that I, I have to have in order to survive. Um, it's just something that I did because that was a normal thing to do. It was a predictable thing to do. So because she did that, she lost 35 pounds actually through the pandemic, which is a really significant amount. If you think about just drinking one mocha frappuccino a day for so long, 
that when we stopped for five, six, seven months, we could lose 35 pounds off of that. A really significant piece. So how can we change our habits to be good for us? So in the last story I shared, and even in the previous one about, about my husband and myself, um, one of the things that I really like to point out is us as humans love patterned, predictable things. So we like when things are predictable, meaning if I go to Starbucks every morning, I like to go to Starbucks every morning because it's predictable. If that changes, our brain gets really anxious, which kind of sounds funny because it's like, well, if it's not good for you, why does it do that? Well, simply, our brain likes to make things predictable because it keeps us safe and it keeps us secure. So how do we change those, those pathways? How do we change those um, habits and to make new, better habits out of it? Well, we have to change our mindset a little bit. So the woman in the Starbucks um, story doesn't need Starbucks and she doesn't need to avoid it for the rest of her life. Instead of ordering a really calorie rich drink, instead you can order something that's lower calorie. You can do a healthier option or you can limit the amount of times you go there. So instead of going every day, we go once a week or we go once every other week. Um, that helps us create different, more healthy habits. Similar to the cycle that I was talking about before, if we, instead of jumping from I feel stressed to I'm going to eat a bag of cookies, if I said I'm stressed, so I'm going to go take a walk or I'm going to take a five minute break, then we can, can shift our brain pathways and say that's actually what I want to do instead of going and getting that bag of cookies. Um, similar with like replacing soda and water. I know that's a really big thing for people is um, feeling kind of that, that crash in the afternoon. So we grab more coffee or we grab soda or whatever. Instead of saying, I want the soda, you can say, I want a glass of wa water rather than the soda. So really start building those um, different thought processes in, in our brain saying, okay, this is actually something that I want to be different. And almost willing our brain to change those neural pathways. So how does food shape our brain? Well, food is really important for our brain, um, just as it's, as, as it's important to our bodies. And I'm not going to sit here and lecture everybody about what to eat and how you eat. But I think it's important for us to also understand what we put into our body is going to actually um, either positively or negatively also affect our mental health. So our brain needs really good fuel in order for it to function properly and effectively. So it needs food that's rich in vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. So um, if I eat a salad, that's helpful, but it doesn't mean that I'm denying myself anything else. It just means I wanna make sure that the food I'm putting into my body is also going to fuel me optimally. It doesn't mean I don't eat a slice of pizza with it. It just means I'm not only eating the pizza, it means that I'm eating both, both sides of things. Um, the other piece is what you eat directly impacts the structure and function of your brain, which ultimately means your mood, right? So we have seen in the field of psychology, people who have really poor diets, so diets that are um, rich in carbohydrates and sugars and fats, are usually linked to depression or even higher forms of anxiety. Um, caffeine is another really big one. If we are drinking immense amounts of caffeine a day, um, our anxiety tends to spike quite, uh, quite frequently. And so again, it's not saying you can't have any of those things. It's how do we balance those out? How do we balance it out and say, okay, I'm gonna eat uh, like more fruits and vegetables while I'm also eating chocolate, right? We can have both of those things. We're just not going to only rely on the chocolate for our, for our diet. Another piece is high refined sugars. So similar to what I was saying before are definitely really harmful for the brain. So um, we all have kind of heard if you eat a lot of sugar, um, our insulin res regulation for our body can be really hard. Um, but it also promotes or, sorry, inflammatory pieces as well as oxidative stress, meaning 
um, if we are only eating, if we're eating a ton of refined sugars a day, um, we're having more crashes, which means our brain is trying to work harder in order to function. And so um, people who say, I feel like my brain is just mush by the end of the day, or I feel like I'm having to work twice as hard this week to even get one of my projects done because I can't think straight. Well, the first thing I typically ask clients is, what are you eating throughout the day? Are we eating a lot of sugar? Are we eating a lot of carbohydrates? Because that will definitely impact um, our functioning of our brain. Um, the other, the last piece that I'll kind of talk about is um, how we, or, or the circulating of the brain, sorry. So um, free radicals or damaging inflammatory cells circulating within the brain, which is an enclosed space. So it actually, if we eat a lot of high refined sugars, um, the other pieces we, we see a lot of um, salt content can do this as well. Um, it actually damages the tissue of the brain, meaning that our, our brain can't reproduce the amount of cells needed in order for it to keep functioning at a high level. Um, when we do that as well, the chemicals in our brain also shift. So um, similar to what I was talking about the cycle before, we're kind of getting these highs and lows at very spiky um, intervals. So um, instead of producing its natural dopamine, like a like brain would do if we were eating quality foods, if we were walking, if we were journaling or having creative time, it actually makes it so it's creating almost false, uh, I say false in a way, it's, it's not creating its own dopamine because these high sugary foods are increasing our dopamine um, almost without our permission. And so then our brain can't actually ever catch up on that. And that's how our mood is also really linked to this as well. So let's look at kind of different types of diets because um, it can get even trickier. So if we look at a Mediterranean style diet, a lot of Mediterranean diets are filled with vegetables, seafood, fresh herbs, garlic, olive oil, um, and high, like not refined grains. So um, things like whole wheat and, and whatnot will also, that helps reduce depression symptoms. So it's high in um, those foods we were talking about before, and it's mineral rich. Um, it has quality fats in it and quality grains in it instead of refined grains, and that's a really important piece. Um, versus the two types of foods that can really be harmful to the brain, which we kind of already talked about, is caffeine, um, as well as sugar or things that are in high fat or high fat, sorry. Um, so those, again, those foods will trick our brain to releasing a lot of chemicals that we might be lacking and say, okay, we have this really high spike, but then our brain stops producing it itself. And it almost needs those foods in order to get back to a baseline state. So we, we don't want to eat diets high in those things because of that reason. So let's talk a little bit about mindful eating. Again, I think mindfulness is um, a, a buzzword that we hear a lot. We hear a lot about being mindful right now, um, which is a good thing, but I think we have to know how to do it too. So mindful eating is the essence of being aware of what we're putting into our body, how it tastes, uh, what texture it's like, um, what we're gaining from eating it, and those are kind of the three pieces that I think we talk about a lot, especially in, in um, therapy and things when we're working with clients. However, mindful eating goes a lot further than that. So the first piece is we have to create it, right? We have to wanna create a shopping list and create it with intention. So mindfulness is really about intention. If I have an intention to eat a piece of cake, I am making sure that I, understand that I'm eating it because I want to eat it. I'm not mindlessly doing it. I'm not just doing it because it's in front of me. Um, but if I am creating a grocery list and I'm creating it with intention of, hey, I want to get foods that are going to fuel my body and my brain more and help me feel better, um, we avoid those unhealthy things much more frequently than if we're just creating a list of what we would normally get. So the other piece about that is really adhering to our list. And I joke with people, I am 
probably like my my grandparents who they used to write grocery lists all the time um and i stick with them so i do not buy anything that's not on my grocery list so avoid impulse purchases which is the hardest thing because i love muffins and every time i walk by the bakery i want to go grab a box of muffins um, but I really avoid it unless I'm being intentional of that's what we're going to have this week. Um, and then how else am I going to make sure we're going to have other healthy foods around it as well. The other piece is filling our cart. So when we fill our cart um, in the produce section and avoid a lot of the center aisles. So meaning shop on the outside of a grocery store instead of in the center of a grocery store. We really avoid those processed foods. Um, most grocery stores are set up the same, where their fresh produce, dairy, meat are all in the outside sections, um, and most of their processed foods are on the interior section. So if we can shop on the outside and fill our cart more with those than with the interior, we'll have a more successful, um, more successful grocery haul. The other piece is ignoring those well-placed candy, uh, candy dispensers at the checkout saying, I'm not gonna buy the Reese's or the Hershey's bars and all that kind of stuff that's sitting right in the checkout line too. So let's get to the eating part. So eating is really important of, again, how do we uh, differentiate that we're eating because we're hungry and we're eating emotionally. So again, hunger comes slowly and it is really important when you start feeling hungry to start making a plan of what we're gonna eat. So we don't wanna eat when we're so hungry that we feel like we're gonna pass out if we don't eat something, right? So if we're skipping meals, um, if we're avoiding a lot of like protein and things like that, we'll often get to this like ravenously hungry place. When we do that, we mindlessly eat and then we, we overeat and that's kind of where we get into that cycle. But if I'm starting to get hungry and I say, okay, I can take five minutes in the next, you know, 10 minutes, um, before my next meeting to go eat an apple. Well, I'm fueling myself without giving overly hungry. And then when I eat my lunch, I don't feel like I'm starving. Um, the other big thing, and I, I know it's really hard, especially when we're busy at work, is making sure we do not skip lunch. And I hear this time and time again from a lot of people. Well, I don't have time to eat lunch. So I just, I skip it and I just eat, eat a big dinner when I get home. Well, the problem with that is that actually tells our body that we are in a stressful situation and it stores more of that fat. It also doesn't send signals to our brain saying when we're full or not. And so, um, and it causes us to be more stressed, right? So it releases our stress hormones because it thinks we need to either fight something or we need to slow our digestive system down so we can get ready to flee. Um, and that's not what we want. We don't want that fight or flight system igniting. The next piece of, of being mindful about our eating is how do we start with small portions um, and not large portions? So uh, one of the things that I think can be really helpful is instead of getting really big dinner plates, actually use like salad plates um, and fill that up first. Because in our brain, if we see a really big plate, we wanna fill that plate, right? We, we don't like empty spaces as humans. We like to fill things. We like it to have a limit. Um, but if we can do smaller plates, we fill the portions more accordingly and we fill it with smaller portions. And then after we eat, wait. Um, so this kind of goes into the appreciation of food as well. Um, but you want to wait about five minutes or so before going and getting more. Now, if you're still hungry, go and get more food. That's not what we're saying with this. It's more of how do we just appreciate what we put in our body? So as we're eating, think about how does this taste? Um, my favorite thing to, to talk with people about, if you, um, if you eat rice, uh, actually like think about how the rice tastes. Is it flavorful? Did you flavor it with spices? What kind of spices is that flavor like? If, it, if you put some butter in it, what does that actually taste like? What does the texture feel like in your mouth? When we can ask these questions to ourselves while we're eating, it actually slows ourselves down. It makes us more aware of the food that's happening. And it actually helps our brain connect with our stomach and say, okay, do I really want more food? Am I still hungry? 
or do I feel okay? Do I feel content? Um, and either one of those is okay. I think also not putting a, um, a label on that as good or bad, but really taking your time to enjoy the food and enjoy it in a way that um, is maybe a little bit different than what we've been doing before. The other piece is, is being aware. So like I said before, how do we kind of be aware of our senses? Um, when we're cooking, that's a really good way of doing it. What are we smelling? Um, what are we seeing? Are we seeing lots of colorful foods? Are we seeing really bland things? Um, are we smelling a lot of garlic and onion or salts or pepper? What does that look like? Um, also chewing our food. So uh, humans tend to not chew our food very well. We tend to take like two or three chomps and then we swallow it down. We actually want to do that a little bit more uh, slowly because our mouth is obviously the first part of our digestive system. So when we're chewing our food, identify the ingredients that you put in your food. If we can do that, you'll probably increase the amount of times you chew by about five or 10 chews, which is really good because that also helps our digestion. Um, but it also helps us slow down and not just shovel the food into our, into our bodies. So relationship with food is really important as well. Um, and food actually can have as strong of a relationship with us as um, humans do, right? So like I said in the beginning of this presentation, we oftentimes gather around food um, and we gather around food with other people. And so it holds a really strong relationship for us. Um, it also really begins in childhood. So if we grew up in a family who was very uh, mindful and, and um, paid a lot of attention to what types of foods we ate, so a lot of fruit, a lot of vegetables, our eating habits are gonna go more towards that. If we grew up in a family that was maybe more carb-based or more sugar-based, those are the things that we're gonna go to more as an adult. But we also want to look at food as nourishment and not comfort. And I'm not saying comfort food is a bad thing. Um, but we want to be mindful when we're choosing comfort food, right? We want to be really intentional when we're choosing food as comfort instead of doing it just out of habit. So when we can see food as nourishing, we want to say, okay, this food is going into my body so it can help me function. It can help my brain work the way that it needs to. Um, it is helping me survive. It is helping me be healthy. It is helping me take that five mile hike if that's what we're doing or a bike ride or whatever. Um, versus this food is going into my body because I feel like I need it to survive, right? I feel like I need it in order for me to get over this stressful time. If we're looking at comfort food and we're choosing to eat comfort food, it's more, I'm choosing to eat this because right now that's the fuel that um, that I'm choosing to, to put into my body. If we're going to that over and over and over again is when we want to take a step back and say, how else can I fuel my body, right? How else can I um, make sure that my body is not just being inundated with fats or sugars? So the, the one quote I'm going to leave you with today is addictions occur when you see, seek to fill an emptiness inside inside you with something outside of you. So again, going back to that story of putting the note on the fridge and say, what are you, what are you looking for in here? Or what, what you are looking for is not in here. Um, really being aware that just because I'm, I'm fueling my body with sugar and things like that, um, I'm looking to gain something that I feel is missing inside my own emotions. So I want to gain happiness because I feel really sad, or I want to gain joy because I feel really stressed, or calmness because I feel really stressed. Instead of looking at outside, we have to look internally and say, why am I feeling this way? And what can I choose to create boundaries with in my life in order for me not to feel that way anymore?